season, you know, Evan really has two faces. The face of the past and the face of the future. And a lot of times we focus on the face of the past. We love the story of Jesus. We have our pageant, right? We love this gorgeous entrance of the baby Jesus into the world in the biblical times. But the advent of the future, the face of the future, is crucially important, and that's what Luke gives us today in our lectionary. And it's important to remember that, you know, Luke is employing a common biblical style called apocalyptic writing. In Jeremiah, we have it today. Where we talk about the days are coming. And typically when we hear the days are coming, we know that they're talking about what is commonly known as the day of the Lord, the day of judgment. This is prophetic judgment that is being visited upon us. In Joel, for those familiar with scripture, this is really common stuff. In Joel, we have the portents in the heavens and the earth. We see the same passage, by the way, in Acts. In Isaiah, the earth is violently shaken, and our psalms speak of an uproar of the nations and the raging of the sea. And in Jesus today, in the gospel, he talks about, be careful of that day that it doesn't catch you like a trap. This is prophetic language. But the question is, what is the connection between the birth of a baby and the raging of the seas and the nations being in uproar? And of course, this is the very essence of Advent. And the problem, I think, for a lot of us is in the language, this apocalyptic language. For a lot of us, we don't really buy this literal interpretation that there's going to be a day of the Lord, the day of rapture. So if we're not taking a literal interpretation of this, some of us tend to just dismiss it, gloss over it. But we really can't do that with Scripture. We, should, we ought to do that. We should take it seriously, even if we need to delve more deeply into what it means. So what does this mean, this day of the Lord, this, this day that is coming? Scripture is very clear. There will be catastrophe among human beings following, which follows from a cosmic uproar in the heavens and the earth. Fear seizes people in Jesus' gospel today who actually faint and the heavens shake. And finally, the Son of Man will appear on a cloud. Now, I cannot tell you exactly what all of this means. But again, for those of us who are familiar with Scripture, this shouldn't frighten us because what we can know is that what this means is that something big is happening. In the words of our great prophet Walter Brueggemann, this language will remain larger than life. For that is what apocalyptic language does. It uses unimaginably large language to anticipate unimaginably, unimaginably important events. So what do we do here in this stuff? Well, the first thing that we are asked to do over and over again, even from last week, is to trust God. Not to put ourselves in the pilot seat and decide that the end is near. God decides these things. But what we can do is take seriously the fact that what happens in this world now matters. It is crucially important that we are awake, we are alive to what is going on around us in God's world. And we're given a chance to act. We're given a chance to be part of this healing process that God is always trying to call into being, which is ultimately the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. Now, I don't know about you guys, when was the last time anybody here actually read... Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Oh, man, let me tell you something. If you have kids or if you have family, I suggest there's five stages. I suggest every night, the five nights before Christmas, you sit down and read one stave a night to your kids or to yourselves or to your spouses or something. Because I'm telling you, this is, this is just one of the greatest stories ever written. I just wrote about it in our newsletter, but I've got to say more. The writing is unbelievably beautiful, but what I think it is, it gets so much about what Christmas actually is. Beyond all the theology, beyond all the nice talk about Jesus and candles and the rest of it, but the actual heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching, world-changing, cracking the world open nature that is Advent, or that Advent and Christmas are meant to be for us. For those of you who don't know, it's a story of this man who is just a, you got to read the, I, I just love the opening description of this guy. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. 
hard and sharp as flint, from which no steel had ever struck out generous fire, secret and self-contained and solitary as an oyster. Only Dickens writes like this. So, you know, what ha- you know, Scrooge has, is visited by these three spirits. And I was, I was almost crying reading this stuff. Forget the movies. The movies don't do justice to this. But what happens with Scrooge is he gets this incredible gift. He gets to see his whole life in a flash. All of the missed opportunities. All of the choices he made to seek himself instead of the, good fa- the goodness and welfare of others. Every moment uh, from his own loneliness as a child to when he chose his commerce over this wonderful woman who wanted to marry him and on and on and on. And he undergoes this profound transformation. And just reading it, your heart, your, it, just, it just grips you in your heart because it's us. Dickens has this way of writing that is so beautifully expressive and artistic, but he gets human beings in a way that is just extraordinary. And so this thing that happens to Scrooge is really the story of human beings. And how every moment of every day we have a chance to be in it with God. (laughs) To be in it with other people. To go beyond our self-seeking. We're human beings, we've got to take care of ourselves and our families and all that's great. But what is the purpose of our lives, really? Scrooge, the whole time he's in this process, and this is how brilliant Dickens is, he undergoes this slow transformation. He is drawn back into the goodness of the relationships that he used to have. He's, he sees the beauty and the goodness of others celebrating Christmas while the old skin flint is sitting around jipping people and taking care of only himself. And when suddenly, finally, at the end, he gets it. Before, actually, let me just read this. And this is really crucial for us. It's, he's in the, the, with the, the, the spirit of Christmas present. And they're with Bob Cratchit's family. And he writes, Tiny Tim sat very close to his father's side upon his little stool. I'm getting choked up reading this. Bob held his withered little hand in his as if he loved the child and wished to keep him by his side and dreaded that he might be taken from him. Spirit, said Scrooge with an interest he had never felt before. Tell me if Tiny Tim will live. I see a vacant seat, replied the ghost. In the poor chimney corner and a crutch without an owner carefully preserved, if these shadows remain unaltered by the future, a child will die. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, the child will die. So it's not a very far leap to know the world we're living in. There are situations in this world where if, if, if things are not altered, a child will die. You don't have to get me started on Iraq. And our friends there, they, they are dying. They will die if, if action is not taken. But right here at home, right in your neighborhood, right in our world. So what Scrooge learns is that it matters what you do. His, he gets his, the spirits crack open his heart and his life. And he realizes that it's up to him to make a difference in the people's lives. And he does. The end of the, the last stave, the fifth stave. You're just happy because this man has had this experience. Let me just read this last bit. Because it's just, it's just too cool. He stuck his head out the window. He realizes that it's actually Christmas. He hasn't missed everything. The chuckle with which he said this, and the chuckle with which he paid for the turkey, and the chuckle with which he paid for the cab, and the chuckle with which he recompensed the boy, were only to be exceeded by the chuckle with which he sat down breathless in his chair again, and chuckled till he cried. This is a heart broken open. This is Advent. This is what this season is really for us to understand is that Jesus came into this world, this broken world. We're all a bunch of Scrooges, and you know it. But, you know, we're not going to get visited by three spirits, I, I, I don't imagine. Wish I could. What an awesome experience that would be. But we do have the chance, and our scripture, and our gospels, and our church community, 
and our larger church are being given the same message time and time again. So here's my message on First Advent. Don't be a Scrooge. Wake up. Over and over again in these apocalyptic writings, the words are wake up, sleeper awake. The time is now, or the time is coming, and it deeply matters how we're being with those around us, in our families, in our lives, and in the larger world. So it's a gift. It's like Scrooge. Scrooge was given a gift by being confronted with himself. So let us be confronted with ourselves. And let us know that we are called to this, this, this incredible state of lovingness and generosity of spirit and with our stuff, all to the glory of God. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. amen.